Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Pastor Matt. Welcome. Uh, thank you for being here with us this morning. Um, first of all, I just need to say thank you to the church. Uh, we had a great celebration last week for pastor appreciation. Uh, no, I always feel appreciated, but I so enjoyed the time together uh, around the tables, uh, the kind words, the gifts, the cards, the, the uh, double stuff Oreos. I hid them in my home. Someone found them. No one has fessed up. So, I, I, I know... Okay, okay, okay. But the problem is if I leave them here, I don't have milk here. And I have to have milk with my Oreos, sorry. So anyway, uh, I rehid them. No one has found them yet. So we're good right now. Um, but no, thank you so much for your, your kind words, your care for us. Uh, we, we are so blessed to be here and we thank you so much. Um, we are in this series on Sermon on the Mount. And we've come up to uh, these, this portion of the sermon where Jesus is talking about what we've called the sixth antithesis of, of his sermon. And I'll tell you what, these are hard pieces of scripture to look at because it takes what the law said, here's what you are not to do. And Jesus goes to the intentions of those laws becomes more personal, becomes probably harder for us to live in this way. I mean, how many of you struggle with murdering people, right? When it says, do not commit murder, we don't have that issue probably. But when he says, don't have angry thoughts, ooh, that's a whole nother game. And so if I were not the pastor I am and thought, you know, we could just jump over some things, trust me, we'd be jumping over these. These are hard I'm looking at these next few weeks. I'm like, next week's divorce. Oh, my goodness. I'm glad we did pastor appreciation at the beginning. <laughs> Y'all might not like me by the end of this, right? But this morning, we come to this idea of adultery. In Psalm 24, 3, King David asks, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? And the answer is found in the next verse. It says, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not appealed to what is false and who has not sworn deceitfully. The only person that these words can be applied to perfectly is Jesus. But these words also describe the proper pursuit of everyone who calls Jesus Lord. In the New Testament, there's an echo of these words in this, this sermon we're looking at and, and, and what Jesus is teaching about the deadly lure of lust. It's a sin that originates in the heart, but often expresses itself through the eyes and hands. The prophet Jeremiah reminds us, power is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? In these next four verses, Jesus shows us how true this statement is in specific and concrete terms. We, we a lot of times, we will reduce sin to what we do. We, we often sin with our eyes. We, we, we tend to see it as our actions alone, but Jesus makes it clear that this is rooted in who we are. We'll, we'll sin with our eyes, we'll sin with our hands, but Jesus teaches us that those are only instruments that do the biddings of an evil, lustful heart. These verses, like I said, they're the second of, of six of these antithesis that I mentioned last week. They conclude chapter five. This morning, we turn to this passage about adultery and lust. Fun topics, right? Lighthearted. No, it's not. This is, this is serious stuff. These are things we have to hear, things we need to deal with. So Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 27, here's what it says. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If, you were, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Again, some words that probably shocked the people, right? Kind of woke them up a little bit. The, the, the overarching truth of all these verses in the end, it will be a call to defeat sin. So please hear that. We, we have to view sin as God views sin. We have to realize we're to deal drastically with sin. We're not to pamper it. We're not to flirt with it. We're not even to enjoy a taste of it here and there. We definitely can't treat it as something without consequence. As kingdom citizens, what should our response to sin be? We should hate it. We should crush it. We, we should dig it out of our lives because sin leads to hell. 
That's the ultimate reason we, we have to take sin so seriously. Here, here we see the sin of lust addressed. And once again, the rabbis, they, they, were, they were attempting to limit the scope of the command, you shall not commit adultery. Although the, the sin of desiring another man's wife, that's included in the 10th commandment against covetousness. But they evidently found it more comfortable to ignore this. And in their view, and their, and, and their people kept, uh, sorry, in their view, they and their people kept the seventh commandment, provided that they avoided the actual act of adultery itself. That gave them a conveniently narrow definition of sexual sin and a conveniently broad definition of sexual purity. But here Jesus teaches differently. He extends the implications of the divine prohibition. He, he affirms that the, the true meaning of God's command is much wider than a mere prohibition of acts of sexual immorality. Just as the, the prohibition of murder, he included angry thoughts and insulting words. He's expanded. He says, here, we've got to get to the heart of the matter. We've got to get to the, the, the real issue here. It's not just the act. There's so much more. We can commit murder with our words, and we can commit adultery in our hearts and our minds. Two things need to be mentioned here before we go any further. First, this teaching of Jesus refers to unlawful sex outside of marriage, whether practiced by married or unmarried people. He's not even forbidding us to look at a woman, but forbidding to look lustfully. And we all know the difference between looking and lusting. Now, secondly, Jesus' words are, not, are, are to all forms of sexual immorality. To argue that this reference is only for a man lusting after a woman and not vice versa, or only to, to married men and not unmarried men, it's to be guilty of the very issue that Jesus is condemning the Pharisees. His emphasis is that any and every sexual practice which is immoral in deed is immoral also in look and in thought. This covers everything. It's not just one thing. It's, in re, it's, it's, it's the relation between the eyes and the heart which leads Jesus in these next few verses. This, this is all, all important to grasp because Jesus' equation of looking lustfully and committing adultery, like I said, it, it happens in the heart, not just within the act. What we have to realize, and when we talk about these things, it, it is uncomfortable, right? Anybody want to stand up and admit their issues with lust? No. How many of us, though, think we're the only one that deals with it? This is a broad thing. This pains, this is a, this, 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 this is everywhere. I grew up in the church, and we didn't talk in my church about sex and lust and things like that. And I, I left home thinking, I'm, I deal with this all my own. And then I moved in with a bunch of guys in the college dorms. And at some point, there, these, these friendships grew to a point where we started to share the things we struggle with. And I thought, man, I'm not, I'm not the only person that deals with this. I love that Nathan stands up here and says, you know what, I need to be honest with you, I'm distracted today. You need to see the, the leadership of your church is human. That's what we are. So when I'm speaking of lust, I'm not above this. This speaks to me as well. We're all in this, whether we want to, to, to share it with others or not. Lust is a big issue within our society, within the human, human race. And so we take these, these words of Christ, we, we hear what he has to say, and we need to obey these warnings that he gives us within these verses. And the first thing Jesus says is to shield your heart. He says, shield your heart, guard your heart. Remember last week, I told you, you're going to see this phrase, you have heard that it was said. And here Jesus quotes the seventh commandment, which appears in Exodus and Deuteronomy. It was a well-known command, do not commit adultery. And, and the admonition is plain. It's very simple to hear what it says. A married person is not to have sexual relations with anyone other than his or her spouse. The scriptures take this command so seriously that the act of adultery was punishable by death. And then we, we look at the story of the woman caught in adultery in John's gospel, and it shows us that even the, the people in Jesus' day continued to view adultery as a serious offense. Look at what is written in, in John chapter 8. That, then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, making her stand in the center. Teacher, they said to him, talking to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of committing adultery, and the law of Moses commands us to stone such women. So what do you say? 
See, even in, even in Jesus' time, this is a, 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 an offense punishable by death. Now, now, they did this more for show. They were trying to trip Jesus up or catch him in a, a weak moment, but, but it was taken very seriously. The act of adultery, when it was committed, when it was discovered, it was punishable. Now, the fact of the matter is, any culture with a moral conscience will take sin and marital betrayal of adultery very, adultery very seriously. And, and in today's world, adultery may not be viewed as it once was. Anymore in our world, it's more, it seems more like a, a minor indiscretion that, that mostly is just swept under the rug and, and people move forward. But we've got to be reminded there are some horrible consequences that result when adultery occurs. There was a, an article I came across that gave six reasons adultery is harmful. Because sometimes, like I said, we may not view it that way. You watch a movie and you see adultery happening. You watch sitcoms and you see adultery happening. And it's something that people laugh at and make fun of. And, but there are serious consequences. Serious consequences. Listen to the, the destructive power of adultery. Even, even if our society doesn't view it as a serious matter. In the mind and heart of the God who created sex and marriage, the one who put boundaries on both, it is a serious matter. Adultery is turning away from a promise. It's, it's turning away from one to whom promises were made in the presence of witness. Most importantly, it's forsaking a promise made in the presence of God. And in that way, it's turning away from God himself. Adultery leads the adulterer from security to chaos because the adulterer has turned away. They enter into this life of torn loyalties. Even when the adulterer remains loyal to the new partner, there's still this divided life and this divided family and divided memories. Adultery is, is secretive and dishonest. It, it has to be because no one wants to announce that they are breaking a promise. Adultery loves darkness and, and flees the light for as long as it can. It tries to remain secret. In contrast, think of someone who's, who's announcing a marriage. It's, it's broadcast. It's a joyful announcement and invitations are sent. News of adultery, it leaks out by rumors. It leaks out under pressure. Adultery destroys the adulterer. It does no favors to the adulterer. On, on the contrary, it undermines and it erodes the character and integrity. Like all secret sin, it, it eats away like some noxious chemical at the integrity of the one who commits it. Adultery damages society. It stirs up hatred and, and enmity. It encourages a culture which thinks marriage boundaries really don't need to be quite so rigid. We love to think our sins are our own, that they only concern us. But, but no, our sin goes far beyond ourselves. It impacts Others. Adultery hurts children. Adultery does grievous harm to the innocent parties. Children are harmed when adultery brings chaos and conflict and disunity. No wonder then that the Bible contains such serious, repeated warnings against it. Proverbs tells us, he who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. In Hebrews, we're reminded that God will judge the sexually immoral, immoral and adulterous. Do you get how serious... The act of adultery is. Do you see how God views this? How, how sinfully it should be viewed? This is where Jesus drops this devastating spiritual bomb on, bomb on us. He, he sets his words again in contrast to the teachers who, who stuck doggedly to the letter of the law. Jesus says, but I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus Jesus carries us to a place that we never saw coming, but that was intended by God all along. Once more, we're confronted with an unavoidable and undeniable truth. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. We must ask ourselves, do we conceal lust in our hearts, but count ourselves righteous because we've never followed through with the act? Jesus says, not on your life. Adultery is not limited to the act. It includes the gazing and the, the lingering look that objectifies another person to whom you're not married in a covenant relationship. This is a gaze, not a glance. This gaze, it, it excites the sexual imaginations in the heart and, and you, you're mentally engaging in the act reserved for your spouse in the marriage bed. We've got to realize what Jesus is talking about here. and We've got to respond with the seriousness this requires. 
Look at what we read in 1 Peter chapter 5. He says, be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. Satan's out there watching. He's, he's looking for any way that he can get a foothold in your life or, or, or set you off course in your faith or make you stumble or fall or, or tarnish your, your testimony. Lust seems to be an easy approach for so many who don't take it seriously. We've got to wake up to the truth of Jesus' words in our, our passage this morning and Peter's words here in this verse. We even need to be reminded that this is not a new issue. Go back to Job and look what he had to even say. He says, I've made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I look at a young woman? Job, Job says, I, I have made a covenant not to look. We desperately need people in the kingdom who look like Job today. Be aware, be on guard against the lingering look of sexual gratification. Get your shields up because this can lead to disaster. And it's disaster not just for one, it's for, it's for marriages, it's for families, it's for churches. It, it, it could lead, as we're about to see, to eternal destruction. The next thing Jesus tells us is to protect your eyes. So you can have lust in your heart without your eyes. But your eyes make sinful lust so much easier. Jesus addresses in stark and shocking terms this intimate relationship between the lust, the heart, and the eyes. We, we've got to resist this temptation to water this down. We sometimes can take what Jesus says and says, well, here's what he really meant. And, and it's not quite as severe as he makes it out to be. But I'm going to guess if Jesus is speaking in these terms, this is a, a dire matter. We can't just make it what we want it to say. When we do that, we miss what Jesus says. We miss the impact he intends to make. And Jesus uses two powerful, vivid illustrations in these, these last few verses. He ends both with a warning about hell. The main idea is this. Sinful lust will lead you down a dead-end road. It's not going to deliver what it promises. You, you think it's going to make you happy. Jesus says it's going to lead you straight to hell. So if necessary, he says, take whatever steps you have to to deal with sinful lust. We, we have to act decisively. We have to act immediately, even if it's painful. The drastic nature of the remedy is simply the index of the radical danger of the sin. It's not a, a situation for negotiation. So if your right eye causes you to, to sin, Jesus says, gouge it out and throw it away. The phrase, Causes you to sin is literally causes you to stumble in Greek. And, and in Greek, it's in a present tense, meaning it continually can happen. So the idea is if your eyes keep causing you to stumble into sinful lust, which, which can lead you to hell, you'd be better off to just gouge it out and throw it away. It's far better, Jesus says, to, to throw away one eye than it is to have your whole body thrown into hell. It's possibly one of Jesus' favorite sayings. He, he quotes it more than once. It happens later in this same gospel where, where the foot is added to the eye and, and the hand and the reference is, is a general one to temptation to sin, not explicitly just sexual temptation. So the principle has a far wider application. Even so, this is, this, in this particular realm, Jesus applies it in this sermon to sexual lust. What's Jesus mean by this? We've got to be cautious here because I think there are those who have misinterpreted what Jesus meant here. On the surface, it's a startling command to gouge out an offending eye or cut off an offending foot or hand. Uh, uh, and there are those throughout the church history who have, have had great zeal and ex exceeded their wisdom. That They've taken Jesus literally and they've mutilated themselves. I read stories of, of, of past people that rolled on broken glass to... I mean, they've done these things. I don't think that's what we're, we're looking at here. We don't need to do that because the real problem, it's not the eyes. The real problem is not the eyes. The real problem is with the heart. And, 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 and the eyes can certainly entice the heart. But like I said, you can have lust in your heart without your eyes. And so the key to, to spiritual victory over lust, over really any sin, is not a mutilated eye. The, the key to spiritual victory is found in Deuteronomy. Look at this. It says, therefore, circumcise your hearts and don't be stiff-necked any longer. 
The key is a heart that's been circumcised, a heart that's been changed. It's a, it's a heart that's led now by the spirit and bent on following God's will. It, it's a new covenant heart that's God's law is written on. It's a heart that's gained by faith in Jesus and being born again. Like we read in, in John chapter three, he says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the man, the son of man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world. In this way, he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. See, the best way for us to protect ourselves is to give our heart to him. Allow him to be what protects us. It protects our eyes. It protects our hands. It protects our hearts. A lot of times we want to fight this on our own. We don't even want to talk to Jesus about it. We don't want to bring it before him. We'll just deal with it by ourselves. And I'm going to tell you right now, when you try to do this in your own effort, it's going to fail. It's going to be nothing but futile. We have to have Jesus as our savior. We have to rely on the spirit to lead us into victory. And I wish I could say it's just simple as that. But that humanity is there now. And it's a battle that we have to continue to fight. It's not just a one and done. That's not beyond God. He can do that. But for most people, it's a struggle. It's a battle. It's something that happens daily. We have to continue to choose to give him our heart. We have to continue to choose to follow the spirit in these things. But Jesus doesn't stop with the eyes. He also says, watch your hands. Watch your hands. Verse 30, again, it reinforces what we read in 29. Sin is serious business. We're to perform radical surgery on anything that would cause us to be cut off from eternal life. Jesus removes his, he, he, or he moves his warning from the right eye to the right hand. And this warning parallels the previous warning that we just read in 29. If your right hand becomes a, virtually stumbling, a virtual stumbling block, it's better to take drastic measures and cut it off and throw it away. Why? The reason's the same. It's better for you to, to enter eternity in heaven as a whole, as opposed to just, or as a part, as, a, as opposed to a whole in hell. It's better to experience a temporal loss than an eternal loss. These stakes are really high. We've got to get the seriousness of this. So much is all the line. All of what Jesus is saying is this, this package deal with the heart as the key. The eyes can certainly entice the heart, but the heart entices the eyes and directs the hands. The hand acts in response to the attitude and the direction of the heart. This is why Jesus says at the beginning of the sermon, look what he says. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. We need to gain. We need to pursue a pure heart. We, we, can, we can only receive the pure heart, however, as a gift of grace from God by faith in Christ. The path to purity requires a pure heart and the mortification of the flesh. We see that illustrated in our text by the eye and the hand. John Owen said it this way, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Jesus adds to that, it'll be killing you and sending you to hell. So what are some wise, what are some practical steps we can take to walk the path of purity in this life? I've got four. First, you need to realize where turning to sinful lust will lead you. Look at the end game. Look at, look at where it takes you. Jesus says it directs you to hell. Place that in your mind. Recall it again and again. Deal with the real cause of your sin, right? Make sure you get that this is not an eye issue. This is not a hand issue. This is a heart issue. An impure heart settles for God's substitutes. So, so it's simply idolatry. Ask yourself, what is there in my life that I'm putting in place of God? What do I desire? What do I long for more than anything? God should be it, right? Jesus should be on the throne of our lives. Is he? What, what, what butts in his place? We have to act decisively. We have to act immediately, even if it's painful. And remember, obedience cannot be negotiated. Neither can heaven or hell. The proper time to do something about this is right now. Right here. 
Finally, you've got to realize your lust is not the whole of your life. It's not even the most important part of your life. Think, think and understand what you gain by abandoning it. When you walk away from it, you get Christ. You get an eternity in heaven with the Father. If you sin for what it is, it's, it's this, this cruel taskmaster, and, and lust is one of its favorite instruments that, that can keep us enslaved, that can keep us in bondage. But Jesus came to rescue you. Jesus came to pull you out, to set you free from this never satisfied tyrant. Treasure him above everything else. What you gain will put to shame what you give up. And you'll, you'll start to wonder why you stayed so long entrenched in the sin in the first place. See, it's a hard, it's a hard thing to talk about. But if we can see the end game, if we can see that Jesus is, is the ultimate thing we need, it helps. It brings that hope. It helps us realize we can come beyond this. When we are in Christ, we're able to guard our hearts from temptation. Look back on your life. Look at times where you've been real close to Jesus and, and times where you've stepped away. Think about how your life looks in both those situations. Which one honors God more? When we're drawn to him like a totally devoted lover, the, the attractions fueled by, by lust lose their luster. They find no room in our hearts when in our hearts, in that innermost sanctuary, there is a place reserved only for Christ. Jesus certainly wants to lead and guide our behavior, but first and most importantly, he wants our hearts. And look what 1 Corinthians tells us about it. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. He owns it. It's his what he bought, we should gladly and freely give to him. Treasure Christ above all in your heart and, and, and the eye, the hand, the rest of the body will happily follow its lead. Like I said, I wish it was a, a magic equation that just said, hey, here it is and, and do that and you're fine. You're still going to struggle. I, I want to make sure you understand that this, this is a constant battle. And if it's not lust for you, it's other sins. Let's be honest. It's hard. But the closer we are to him, the closer we come to him, the easier it is to honor God in all we do. Jesus, Jesus is really coming down to this. Like I said, I, I'm, I'm not a fan of these, these six antithesis because they're hard. They're difficult. They're, they're not real well thought of. Some of my least favorite sermons to preach are on sin because, well, we're sinners. And we don't like... Well, I know we like to hear the, the, the joyous sermons that I so frequently give. I'm just going to tell you now, the Bible is a hard book to read, right? The truths in it are not easy. But we weren't promised ease in the kingdom. He says the world's going to look at you different. He says, these are my father's standards. He also says, I'm going to help you live that way. I'm going to give you my spirit because you can't do it on your own. So see the hope in that. Don't walk out of here crushed by the words you've heard. Walk out of here convicted maybe and changed and challenged to follow him more closely. As we've been doing, we're going to take some time to respond to a few questions I'm going to put up here. But, but I've asked a few other questions throughout the, the sermon. But let's look at these that we're going to reflect on over these next few minutes. How do you combat lust? This is, this is one I want you to ask. And, and again, if lust isn't the sin you struggle with, place the sin there that you struggle with. Do you do it in your own efforts or with the power of the gospel? What's your go-to when you, when you start to battle the things in your life that you know you're, you're fighting against and for God? Do you do it by yourself or you do it with his power? The second one, I, I, this is... I, this one's extremely important to me. How can we help one another fight this sin of lust? Like I said, a lot of times we can think, hey, I'm the only person that struggles with this. I guarantee you within the body of Christ, other people are struggling with the exact same things you are. Whether you want to believe it or whether Satan's whispered to you that you're the only one, those are lies. How can we help one another? It's uncomfortable. We might look at that and go, I don't want to do that. But we're called to be a body. We're called to, to walk alongside one another. We're called to do this together. 
So I want you to reflect on those questions. I want you to reflect on what God's spoken to you today. I want you to ask him what your next steps are, what obedience looks like for you in this. Like I said, these, these next few weeks are difficult. They're hard things to hear. They're hard things to learn. Some of you may be still reeling from last week when the angry thoughts and the insulting words, and now we pile on lust. Just know that Jesus is there to help us in this. He gave us his spirit to walk us through this. So we're not alone in this. So I'm going to invite Nathaniel to come to to play some background music, the team if they're coming. Um, And just take a few minutes and sit and reflect on what you've heard. Ponder these questions before we move to a a moment of song. Father God, once more we thank you for this opportunity to hear your word, to dive into your word, to see the truth that sometimes, like I said, is very hard to, to take. It's, it's difficult to preach. It's, it's hard to hear. But Father, your word is there for a purpose. It's there to, to grow us in knowledge. It's there to, to expand our, our uh, recognition of who you are. It's there to correct us and convict us. And so God, whatever it is that's your will in our lives, we pray that you do that through this today. God, help us to see this call to a higher standard of living and and how we can't do it in our own effort. We can try sometimes, and we will, but God, the only way is through your spirit, through your son. So God, help us to recognize that these are things we need to deal with, Father. It's not fun to talk about sin, but again, sometimes in, in today's world, sin is not viewed as it should be. And that should never be so in your church. So God, help us to see it the way you see it. Help us to deal with it the way you call us to deal with it. And Father, find us obedient and faithful as we respond this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name.